thanks very much. I want to uh, thank uh, John Michael uh, for uh, inviting me here, and Barbara and the other board members for uh, uh, seconding that invitation. It's, uh, it's really an honor for me to uh, have an evening with uh, a group who uh, are so committed, uh, who represent uh, such a wide range of perspectives about this issue, but are coming together in, in such an impressive way. When the Addison case was argued for that day uh, in the Supreme Court several years ago, I I uh, here, but I watched on closed circuit, and it struck me that uh, that court was was uh, in a conversation in the in the uh, veiled way that legal language uh, requires uh, that you all are carrying on, uh, and uh, it will be. Uh, uh, a great pleasure to celebrate uh, the moment when uh, the legislature catches up with you and, and does what's in the best interest of, of New Hampshire and uh, uh, abolishes the death penalty. When Thurgood Marshall responded to the majority opinion in uh, the five cases uh, in 1976 that reinstated the death penalty in this country, he responded in a dissent. Uh, and one of the things he said uh, uh, was that if every American understood the death penalty uh, the way the members of the court did, uh, the, the supposed benefits that it, it uh, brought the criminal justice system, but importantly the liabilities, he was confident that uh, the vast majority of Americans would oppose the death penalty. And I, I thought that uh, in, in, in order to try to to give you a perspective about why there's movement now on the death penalty. The right place for me to begin is in 1976 with, with Greg v. Uh, Georgia. Um, and I wanted to, to focus in particular on what it was that the, the court uh, uh, was deciding for the country. What, what was the foundational assertion they made uh, that, that we believe is wrong uh, and, and uh, hope at some point the court revisits. And, it was uh, one of these uh, odd uh, sentences with a double negative in it that, that takes a while to parse. Um, what they found was that the death penalty is not a form of punishment that may never be imposed. Now that's not a ringing endorsement. <laughs> uh, and I, I wanted to, to understand uh, their thinking, so the opinion that uh, is generally thought to speak for the court, which was very divided, was by, uh, written by Potter Stewart, uh, and he said the following, capital punishment is an expression of society's moral outrage at particularly offensive conduct. This function may be unappealing to many, but it is essential in an ordered society that asks its citizens to rely on legal processes rather than self-help to vindicate their wrongs. So I read that a couple of times, uh, uh, again this morning, um, and and realized that that the phrase that m matters most to us now is is about legal processes. So what happens if the processes are not working the way Justice Stewart assumed that day? What happens if the processes are are being subverted? Well, it happens that I know about a modest example of subversion, um, and I know it uh, because it was a detail in a, a book I. I wrote about the Office of the Solicitor General uh, and uh, uh, his unusual relationship to the Supreme Court. So in 1975, the Deputy Solicitor General, who was in charge of, of the criminal division and working with then Solicitor General Robert Bork to write the friend of the court brief for the federal government in those cases in favor of the death penalty um, and making an argument that uh, that the death penalty was a significant deterrent of similar uh, uh, crimes for which uh, an individual had been uh, uh, sentenced uh, uh, to death. He was, he was home, he was, it was late at night, he was watching television, there was a talk show, and one of the guests on the talk show referred to a study by someone named Isaac Ehrlich. Um, so he tracked it down, and, and it was an unpublished study, and in the study, uh, Mr. Ehrlich asserted that for every person uh, who was executed, uh, eight uh, 
victims uh, were spared uh, a ca capital crime um, because the perpetrators would be deterred by the fact of that execution. Now, one of the things that separates the Solicitor General's office from uh, everybody else's is that it really knows the rules. And if you turn to the, the uh, rules of, of the Supreme Court practice, Rule 32 says that if a party has information of general knowledge that it thinks would be helpful to the court in uh, deciding a case, then it can lodge the material with the court. Um, that is, it can submit it to the court for its consideration. The Solicitor General's office uh, was thrilled to have uh, an academic seeming study that supported its assertions about deterrence. It lodged this material, and it happened that the lawyer, one of the lawyers who, uh, who was who was challenging uh, 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 in this particular case, who was in favor of, of maintaining uh, uh, the, the the abolition of the, of the death penalty moratorium, but you know pushing in that direction, uh, was David Kendall, uh, for uh, who is now a partner at a great law firm in Washington, Williams and Connolly, and the deputy called him and told him that this was being lodged, and as Kendall put it to me, he went through the roof. Um, this was an unpublished study, it was full of arcane mathematics, it had never been uh, tested in a trial process, uh, uh, Mr. Ehrlich had never been cross-examined by Mr. Kendall or anybody else, um, and it seemed to be support for a very important issue uh, before the court. Um, and if you go to a digital source about, about uh, uh, that case, um, and you just put in uh, uh, Ehrlich's name, it appears throughout uh, the opinion 24 times. Wow. It's referred to in the majority opinion, not as a, a crucial piece of foundation, but as, a, as an authority, something that can be trusted. And that's why uh, Thurgood Marshall in his dissent went out of his way uh, to raise all of the questions about that study that uh, the opposition hadn't been able to do, do because it wasn't through the trial process. Well, this is a modest example of the legal process. <coughs> this is unfairness uh, of a very explicit kind. Um, and it turns out that uh, right now, uh, if you look at, at the movement in the death penalty, this focus on legal process, this focus on the legal process not working the way it's supposed to do, is right at the center of the conversation. If you go back to 1976 and you look at the discussion about cruel and unusual punishment, and by the way, to get the court's view of that, you don't get it in, in uh, the Georgia case. You have to look in one of the companion cases at, at a an opinion that Justice uh, uh, Byron White wrote. It's, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's kind of hiding the ball uh, in the most uh, astonishing sort of way. But if you, if you track down Justice White's view, he says, of course, the founders uh, made a place for the death penalty in, in the Constitution. Of course, federalism lets the states decide these issues. And uh, you know, we have disagreements about uh, morality, but clearly, uh, for the most uh, heinous crimes, the most heinous offenders, um, it's, it's not inappropriate for the legislature uh, to decide this. Well, there's a bookend uh, to uh, the, 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 the cases from 1976, um, and it's a small bookend so far, uh, but it's a bookend that may grow and is worth watching. In July, uh, in California, a federal district judge uh, named Cormac Carney, found the California death penalty unconstitutional. And he relied on the, the Eighth Amendment, and he relied on the cruel and unusual punishment clause. But what he focused on was the failures of the legal process. And here are some of the facts that he shared. California uh, has, since it reinstituted the death penalty in 1978, uh, has uh, sentenced uh, about 900 people uh, uh, to death, uh, and it has executed 13. Um, 
of the uh, people who uh, have challenged uh, the, the death penalty, uh, about 570, I think, is that is that net number uh, close enough? Um, very few of them um, have had their 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 cases work through the appellate process so that they have uh, a, a real uh, reckoning with the argument they're, they're making uh, in favor of their getting life without parole as opposed to uh, a death sentence. But the individual whose case uh, Judge Carney responded to uh, had been uh, on death row for 19 years uh, with his appeals pending. And it turns out that of the, the, the cases that uh, have gotten uh, uh, consideration, and it's about uh, 81 of them, 49, which is roughly 60%, um, have uh, been found to have a serious enough error so that the, the death penalty has been thrown out. Um, and what Judge Carney found was that uh, the delay uh, in the, these executions means that, that if someone uh, ends up being executed, there's no retributive value. Uh, uh, there's, there, uh, there is not great benefit to uh, victims, though I defer to people who have suffered a great loss at, in a crime that gets involved in one of, one of these cases. Um, and what he found was that it's, it's so arbitrary, that the numbers are so small, that uh, uh, it's, it's clearly uh, unconstitutional. It's, it's like sentencing someone to the possibility of the small possibility of being executed and not knowing and not knowing. And so uh, that's a kind of bookend. This is the legal process in, in what used to be the, the state leading the way for, for the country. Um, a judge on the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, a senior judge, Arthur Alcaron, uh, published a study on the death penalty in, in 2011. Uh, which he, he uh, co-authored with a professor at a, a local law school. He went into the study as a, as a supporter of the death penalty. He, he, he wanted to figure out an argument for uh, this day and age in California. And what he found was that the state had spent about $4 billion uh, on its death machine. Uh, and, uh, and the reason Justice Blackmun, when he declared his opposition, said, he would no longer tinker with the machinery of death is, in, in, from the, this judge's point of view, is that uh, it was a, a dismal failure. A complete failure was the phrase he actually used when he announced that he had changed his position. By his calculation, each of the executions in the state uh, had cost a little over $300 million. Um, and uh, it, uh, it was such a burden to the state that, that uh, uh, he, he, he thought that there the system just needed to be rid of, of this, uh, this uh, uh, preoccupation that was so expensive in, in every possible way and really a stain uh, on, on the state. Well, um, this isn't a surprise to those of you who have been following uh, this issue uh, for a good while. Uh, it's why in 2009 the American Law Institute, which is kind of like this organization, except all judges and legal scholars and, and uh, people who scratch their heads full time about the law. It's a nonpartisan organization. It's a serious organization with a sense of mission about trying to, to figure out what's right in different areas of the law. And overwhelmingly, in 2009, it, it voted no longer to support the, the death penalty because of this issue of legal process. It just thought that it was very unlikely that the death penalty could be implemented in a way that was fair in process and fair in outcome. Um, and uh, there's all kinds of uh, evidence uh, to support uh, the foresight of this organization, the, the sense that it, it gave us a vision of how to think and talk about it, putting the hard moral questions aside and, and just focusing on the issues of, of uh, the, the resources required to carry this out. So in the last six years, uh, 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 six states, or seven years, six states have joined uh, to abolish the death penalty, so there are 18 now. And uh, there are 
12 states in addition to those that haven't uh, carried out uh, an execution in, uh, that have the death penalty on their books but have, haven't carried out an execution in, I think it's now uh, eight years. So that's 30 uh, uh, of our states. Um, and it turns out that that really vastly understates the retreat from the death penalty uh, in this country. If you count up all of the sentences for death uh, in the country since the death penalty was reinstated, they've all taken place in counties uh, representing about 20% of the United States. If you look at all of the executions that have taken place in, in this recent period, they have uh, all been carried out in counties representing about 15% of the United States. If you look at last year, uh, there were uh, 80 uh, death sentences uh, handed down. Those took place in counties representing about 2% of the United States. And if you look at the executions, 39, they represent roughly a little bit more than 1%. So there's been uh, a, a striking retreat and, uh, and uh, really a kind of moratorium, if not a kind of informal uh, abolition. There are two narratives uh, over the last few years that are visceral ways to, to understand how the legal process uh, can go wrong. Um, uh, the, the first one starts with sodium thiopental. Uh, so in the, in the, the so-called free drug cocktail, uh, that was used by uh, almost all states as the first drug, as the sedative. Uh, before the paralytic agent, uh, before the agent that stopped the heart. Um, and uh, what happened is, uh, because of uh, campaigns against the death penalty, the one company uh, in this country that was supplying most of the sodium thiopental and had been approved by the FDA stopped doing that. So there was a case uh, that, that uh, got lots of attention for a brief while just about four years ago. It came out of Arizona and involved a man named Jeffrey Landrigan. And uh, Arizona was one of the states that had relied on this supplier of sodium thiopental and couldn't get it from there anymore. Um, so Mr. Landrigan's lawyers uh, uh, asked the state for uh, an explanation uh, about where the drug was coming from. And some proof of its efficacy, as they like to say, its effectiveness. And um, the state said no. Uh, the state uh, wouldn't reveal where it got the stuff, and it wouldn't reveal uh, whether it was good or not. It said, you know, we know our job, um, and, uh, you know, that's our job. Um, and the Mr. Landrigan finally went to federal court, and four times a federal district judge ordered the state of Arizona to reveal this information, and four times the state uh, 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 refused. So the judge stayed the execution, and the case went up to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit uh, uh, upheld the stay, and the case went to the, the Supreme Court, and I just want to read you um, the, the language uh, of the court's uh, order vacating the stay so that that day Mr. Lankin uh, was executed. Um, it's, it's unusual for the Supreme Court to explain itself this way. Um, uh, and it said, there is no evidence in the record to suggest that the drug obtained from a foreign source is unsafe. The district court granted the restraining order because it was left to speculate as to the risk of harm but speculation cannot substitute for evidence that the use of the drug is sure or very likely to cause serious illness and needless suffering. There was no showing that the drug was unlawfully obtained, nor was there an offer of proof to that effect. Now, those sentences are quite sure of themselves, and they bristle with uh, at least a touch of impatience. But to me, the logical failure uh, of the sentences in response to record is absolutely clear. There was no evidence because the state of Arizona had obstructed justice and had not complied with an order of a federal district judge to explain itself. Um, and 
this is another example of uh, a failure of process. Um, and it suggests what the death penalty looks like to a court that uh, is ambivalent about the death penalty. On the one hand, uh, over uh, the last decade and a half, it's slowly moved uh, to, to uh, uh, limit the death penalty. Uh, so uh, people who commit a crime when they're under the age of 18, who as adults uh, uh, would be considered uh, to have committed a capital offense, they can't be. Uh, they can't be given the death penalty. Uh, under the Atkins case, uh, people who are intellectually disabled uh, can't be sentenced to death. So there, there seems to be movement, but it's, it's not incremental movement that we want to see. Um, and uh, most of the time, uh, the court's basic response is that this is an issue of uh, federalism. This is an issue for, for the states to, to, to work out. Um, so, within three months after Mr. Landrigan was, was executed, it was revealed that something called Dream Pharma, which was run from a driving school in London, London was the supplier, that the, that the sodium thiopental had come from uh, a, a company no longer in operation in, in, in Austria. The batch number, uh, which was represented when the sodium thiopental was made, was 2006. Um, and sodium thiopental was generally said to be effective for a year, so this was 2010. Um, and the FDA had originally looked at the imported drug for adulteration and then decided it no longer wanted to be in the business of anything to do with death. Um, so it, it said that it, it just wouldn't uh, certify the drug, uh, which meant that it couldn't be imported. Um, it was imported legally, uh, illegally without FDA approval. So the sodium thiopental that was used to uh, help execute Mr. Langergan was um, quite likely ineffective and almost certainly illegally imported. Well, this is another one of the examples of, of, of a failure of process. And um, the, the last year, uh, we've seen failures of process of a, of a much grislier kind. Um, you know, in January in Ohio, Dennis McGuire uh, gasped for air and struggled when uh, they, they uh, uh, had trouble uh, injecting him. Um, and when his family uh, sued the state afterwards, they alleged that it looked and sounded as though he was suffocating. Uh, in April in Oklahoma, Clayton Lockett uh, um, had a, 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 a similar uh, challenge. They ultimately found a vein in his groin, uh, but uh, it was uh, clear that he was conscious when, when uh, people in, uh, in the state had said that he was unconscious, uh, uh, writhing, clenching his teeth, absolutely uh, uh, straining to lift his head. Um, and uh, an hour later, still in the uh, execution chamber, he died of a heart attack. Uh, and back in Arizona, uh, uh, Joseph Wood uh, gasped repeatedly for an hour and 40 minutes while uh, they were uh, trying to, to uh, execute him. And uh, a reporter who was there counted 640 gasps uh, before, uh, before he died. Um, so, what do we learn about uh, the death penalty from this one narrative? Uh, well, the last big case that the Supreme Court took, uh, Bays v. Reese in 2008, uh, five to four, the, the, the court found that there was no problem with, uh, with the, the, the three-drug uh, cocktail used in, in Kentucky, um, and um, the Chief Justice said, uh, writing for a plurality, a group of people, that, the, that uh, the injection carried neither substantial nor objectively intoler intolerable risk. Um, and what's important about that case in the history of, of uh, the death penalty is uh, Justice uh, John Paul Stevens, after 33 years at the age of 88, quietly saying that he could no longer support the, the death penalty. That, it was a gratuitous infliction of suffering, he said. Um, and that it, it just didn't do what it was supposed to do. Um, on the issue of deterrence, uh, by then, the uh, 
National Research Council uh, had put together a, a blue ribbon uh, committee of, of scholars who looked at every study ever done uh, by academics and said that there was just no reliable evidence uh, showing uh, deterrence. Um, and uh, what the American Law Institute uh, concluded in 2009 um, seemed to be true uh, from, from uh, these instances that uh, the states could not meet basic concerns of fairness in process and outcome. Well, the, the story about, about how the court has dealt with uh, people who uh, have a condition of intellectual disability um, seems to be a more positive one. Um, uh, after a dozen years of letting the states have the discretion to work out their own tests for, for uh, uh, deciding whether someone uh, met the, the, the exemption standard uh, and couldn't be sentenced to death, in, in the case of uh, 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 a defendant in Florida, the, the court uh, took, took, uh, took serious note of what psychologists and psychiatrists had instructed and said that there couldn't be a bright line. You couldn't say, below 70, yeah, you're exempted. Above 70, sorry, you're out of luck. That this is a, a, a condition uh, and that has to be assessed by clinical evidence. And, and that seems to be uh, something that, uh, to give us heart about the, the open-mindedness of the court, its, its willingness to, to do justice. But the problem with these cases is that they're really about uh, the, the narrowing of habeas corpus, which is the way uh, a, someone convicted of, uh, uh, of a capital crime and sentenced to death can challenge. And because most of the lawyers who get these cases are poorly paid and inexperienced and are way over their heads when it comes to this kind of case, and because in uh, 1996, something called the Anti-Terrorism and, uh, and Effective Death Penalty Act was, was passed, um, which greatly narrowed uh, the, the utility of, of habeas corpus. This writ that was once called the Great Writ, that is supposed to stand for an individual's ability and, and right to challenge the government, has withered. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, just a, a, a pale imitation of, of what existed uh, 50 years ago in federal law. And so this is another example where, where uh, legal process isn't working the way it's supposed to. So the argument in favor of the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act was that these cases were taking too long, uh, that there was malingering on the part of lawyers, and, and uh, you know, they were just stalling because they, they didn't want their, their clients to, to be executed. And, so, uh, James Lieben, who is uh, one of the leading scholars about the death penalty in this country at Columbia Law School, looked at every case uh, that, uh, in which someone had been sentenced to death uh, from the, the reintroduction of the death penalty in 2000, about 5,700. And what he found was that there were serious, uh, there were serious enough errors found by state courts and federal courts in seven out of ten of the cases uh, uh, to throw them out uh, so that uh, 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 likely the defendant would, would end up uh, with life without parole rather than the death sentence. Well, this is a hard issue. Uh, no, no question about uh, the death penalty uh, is simply answered in history or in argument. But from my perspective, the book ends from where we were in 1976 when the, when the court reinstated uh, capital punishment to what we see uh, in the California case this summer. The book end is to focus on the legal process, um, um, to put aside the, the moral disagreement, um, uh, leaving to, to those of us who, who think that the death penalty is, is barbaric to think that and have that be a motivation but to focus on this use of, of, of resources. Uh, what, what could police do if they had more money uh, to investigate murders? Uh, uh, what could prisons do if they had more money uh, uh, to uh, offer programs 
for rehabilitation? What could communities do if they had more money to help the reentry of, of offenders when they're let out of prison? These are huge issues in American criminal justice. And the death penalty um, has taken away resources on a scale that, um, uh, to get back to uh, Thurgood Marshall, if most Americans under, understood this, uh, they would, they would, and most un Americans understood that that the alternative is is life without parole, its own kind of purgatory, and and uh, uh, Dante argued uh, much worse than a death sentence. Um, they would they would be with you, um, and my confidence is that that because we know so much more about how the death penalty fails as a matter of. of uh, uh, justice administration. Um, all of us are, are better equipped to make this, make the argument, um, and uh, to support uh, noble uh, and important efforts uh, like yours to get rid of uh, 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 a state death penalty. I'd be glad to uh, take some questions or hear your responses. I think we've got ten minutes, five minutes, yeah, five, minutes yeah. five minutes. I would just like to know. So, so the Innocence Project, uh, which focuses on uh, innocence be because of DNA, um, so uh, the, the question was, how many uh, people who have been uh, uh, sentenced to death uh, were later found to have been innocent? And I, I um, been killed. I'm talking about the ones that who were innocent and dead. So I don't, I don't, I can't answer that question. The question I can answer is that. The Innocence Project has so far freed uh, 18 people who are on death row um, um, and who not only were wrongly sentenced but were wrongly convicted. Uh, and um, uh, you know that 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 fact alone um, is enough to give any humble person pause. I mean, we're here um, opposed to getting New Hampshire where it isn't being done, and I just wonder if you could reflect some on the efforts. Uh, focused on that one percent of counties where it actually is being done. So, one of the most important stories. The, the question is: focus on the on the on the counties where this is being done. Um, you can do some homework and answer that question for yourself. If you go to the American Bar Association's website and look up death penalty assessments, you'll see that since 2001 they've done assessments in 12 states all of them uh, with troubled histories related to the death penalty. And what you find is uh, just a sea of troubles. Let's just focus on Kentucky. And we'll focus on Kentucky because that's where the, the last big uh, Supreme Court case came from. So the next year, the ABA came out with its, its assessment. And what it found was that um, of, uh, I think the number is of 79 <coughs> people in the period they would looked at, probably uh, 15 years who had been sentenced to death. In 55 of the cases, there were egregious errors uh, that either led to the case being thrown out or a retrial. In lots of cases, uh, uh, prosecutorial misconduct, withholding evidence in violation of the so-called Brady Rule. Um, in lots of cases, uh, racial discrimination in the makeup of the jury, um, so that Kentucky, like Georgia, like Connecticut, like a dozen other states, um, uh, ended up uh, convicting and sentencing to death blacks who, who killed whites much more than any other combination. Um, there, you know, there's a there's a, a big literature about this. One professor, Frank Zimring, who was at Chicago and then uh, uh, University of California at uh, uh, both Berkeley, um, did a study where he found that this traces uh, back to a kind of vigilante justice that in the, the, uh, the uh, southern states uh, that had seceded in, in the Civil War, um, there is much more uh, uh, of a likelihood of, of embracing this as a, as a retributive uh, tool, as a sign of vengeance in criminal justice. To me, the most interesting context for this is what's happened generally in, in the, the criminal justice system. 
the most powerful figure now is not a judge, it's a prosecutor. Prosecutors uh, uh, in most states are, are given a wide uh, array of, of uh, crimes to charge with, and they tend to overcharge to force uh, uh, plea bargains. Most of uh, the criminal justice cases ended up uh, being resolved by plea bargains. I think the, the number throughout uh, the federal and the state systems is around 95%. Um, and what, what you find is that there are certain prosecutors, and it's not just in the South, uh, it, it, uh, it's in some northern states as well, who just believe in, in this club. Uh, and uh, so to have examples here of legislators and others involved with criminal justice who uh, recognize what uh, Justice Marshall called the liabilities. Uh, it's very impressive. What, two more? Okay. Um, in your personal experience, do you feel like the bringing the moral issues to the table is a hindrance? Um, do you think we would be more successful if we really did focus um, more precisely on the economic costs and liabilities? So the, the question is, um, is there a liability to making the moral argument, or is it actually a, a useful tool? What's the best way to make this argument? Um, in the end, this is a moral issue, and, and uh, I don't think that that can be ignored. And um, that's that's a motivation for me, uh, even if I don't always express that that point of view. But what's different now is that there's so much data about what a waste of resources this is, every kind of resource, um, with, without accomplishing either of the goals that the Supreme Court uh, uh, said made, made sense. So uh, the, I, I think you have to know your audience, and the part of the Constitution right now that matters most is not the Eighth Amendment or the Fifth Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment with their due process clause and the Equal Protection Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. It's the Tenth Amendment. And that's the really convoluted one that says, stuff that we don't keep for ourselves in the federal government, and stuff that we haven't kept you from doing as states, is up to you. And that's why criminal justice is by and large a state matter. And that's why you're on the front lines. Um, um, yes, it would be great for there to be a movement uh, of cases like the one out of California last summer. But the victory that I would bet on is, is here in New Hampshire and in other states. reaction to, to uh, the, the Isaac Ehrlich study uh, that, that had feet of play. Um, here in New Hampshire, you've got the, the best example of a modest Supreme Court, former Supreme Court justice, uh, who never thought that, that uh, uh, he got everything right, but worked very hard to do that uh, in David Souter. And uh, there, there's some of that on, on the court, but you know, that they, they speak through their opinions and I guess through their memoirs as well. <laughs> but um, but what ha what's happened is that there's now, uh, there's now a really robust uh, field of, of criminology uh, that led to that, that finding uh, by that Blue Ribbon Committee uh, a few years ago that uh, these, these studies uh, just don't support what they say they support. And you know, that, the, the the world of ideas uh, is generally slow, um, but when a consensus like that forms, it's it's hard to undermine it. And uh, that issue is is from the point of view of the people who know most about it, that's settled now. Um, thanks very much. I'm getting going. <laughs>